Good morning. How are y'all today? For those of you who don't know, I'm the youth pastor here at Autumn Creek. I've been incarcerated since 2019. I mean, I've served in the youth since about 2019. And today, as up on there, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Um, Sammy is desperate to give someone a Bible. Please let just take it, even if you have one. So, has anyone walking through their life just had someone make an impression upon them that just stuck? It, it was a lifelong impression. For me, it was a, a, a gentleman I met in high school, and of course the slides worked this morning, and then as Autumn Creek fashion, they don't work now. The youth runs the place. I can't, I can't explain why. Please shut one of the PowerPoints down. This is not making a good impression of my first time. I blame Stu for this. Somehow, this was him. So I started high school in about 92, 93, if I can remember. And my first day there, I met this guy that just was the epitome of intimidation. He just was one of the most intense people that you would ever meet, I have ever met. His name was Colonel Andrew R. Bland, Jr. He was my ROTC instructor when I was in high school. Uh, to say that he didn't have an impact on my life was beyond the pale. That's me right before we lost him. I'm a full-grown adult with children, and I'm standing next to my superhero, and I look like a child. To give you a little background about him, he was the colonel and the commander of the European forces in the 70s. He decided to retire from the Army, and he decided to take a teaching role and became an ROTC instructor. He started at Reagan High School here in Houston. He then moved on to being with the HISD command staff, which means he moved from a teaching position to an admin position. That didn't last very long before he came to my school, which was Sam Houston High School. There are thousands of kids, adults, that were impacted by this man. All he wanted to do was make you do your best. And that's who we should strive to be as Christians. Disciple makers that just want the best from the people that we're around. We'll go into Luke chapter 5 now. This is a pretty familiar story. We'll start in verse 1. And it says, One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen. One were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. 
When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So can you imagine just going about your day? You're just doing your, 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 your life. And that's what Simon and Peter, or Simon, Peter, and James, and John, and Andrew were doing. They were just out fishing, which to some of us in this room sounds fantastic just to live a life of fishing. Doesn't matter if we catch anything. What is that? I'm oh, sorry, my son is an idiot. Um, but to Andrew and Simon and James and John, that was their way of life. That was dependent on, if they didn't come home with anything, they didn't have food, they didn't have fish to sell for money. They, they, they were non-existent of substance at that point. And can you imagine fishing all night long and not catching anything? And then some guy sits in the boat. Let's acknowledge that Jesus was a sound guy because he knew that pushing out onto the water a little bit was going to reflect the sound off the water and make his voice travel a little bit greater. So sound men are important. <laughs> I knew that would get a rise. But Peter was married. Peter, this was a very uncertain time. You had, he had nothing. He didn't have anything to go home with. And in that moment of doubt of what I'm going to do, that's when Jesus showed up. A lot of times they'll say, that's where I found Jesus. And we need to correct that. Jesus isn't lost. We are. That's where Jesus finds us. And we all have had or are going through times where we're out living our lives. We're living it to the best of our abilities. And we're doing everything we can. We think we're doing everything right. And it just nothing seems to mesh together. We can't make ends meet. We get we get two or three months into a project and everything's going great and one catastrophe away from, from it just all going south. And we don't have anything to fall back on. And that's when Jesus meets us. Because we can all admit, we, lo we serve a God that is full of love and constantly moving forward, constantly moving towards us. Constantly saying, here I am. Come with me. Don't go that way. Don't go this way. Just, just stay with me. And like A.W. Tozer said, the reason why many men are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. We're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work within us. I do it. We do it. Jesus, please take this thing from me. You're not doing it fast enough, so give it back. Or, I didn't study for this test, so can you please help me get through it? And we come to the end of ourselves and, and we don't realize until we're about ready to let go of the rope that what we really need to do is let go of the rope. Jesus told them, just cast your nets one more time. And even though they didn't understand, they gave it a shot. 
And Peter, being at the end of himself, feeling unworthy, he fell at Jesus' feet. And he said, I'm, I'm not even worthy. I'm a sinner. Go away from me. And Jesus says, told you so. No. Jesus looked at him and said, follow me. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, it, it, it's recorded as saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And what is that, what is that for us? What is being a fisher of men? It's being a disciple. And how do we define disciple? Now, we have defined disciple here in our own Bible studies as a disciple is just someone who's learning, someone who is in engaging in with Jesus. In some definitions, you'll find out disciple just means apprentice. It means being next to someone. Well, let's find out what it actually means. Let's go back to Matthew. Let's go back to verse 4. Follow me. That's number one. Follow me. Called by Jesus. To be a disciple... You're called by Jesus, just like Jesus did with Peter and, and Andrew and James and John. He called to them and said, follow me. Just come with me. Didn't give them the directions. Didn't say where the end road was going to be. Didn't tell them how he was going to get there. He just said, come. And it takes coming into relationship with Jesus. When we are following Jesus, we are building upon a relationship that is just his and mine. Your relationship with Jesus is going to be yours and his. And that's what he wants from each and every one of us. He just wants us in relationship with him. Judas walked for him with him for three years. But in the end, he still sold him out for the money. Because even though he walked, even though he answered, didn't answer, he answered the call, he didn't, he didn't build the relationship with Jesus. The Bible says he was a devil from the start. And so you have to ask yourself, was Judas just following the crowd? Oh, these are where the guys are going? Could he have had an impactful moment that led him to Jesus? Absolutely. But he calls us in the darkness of this world, we see his light. And he calls us out of that darkness, and we can answer and be made new. We still live in the world, but we have Jesus at our side guiding everything that we do. Come to me, all who, are heavy, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I tell the youth all the time, sidebar, I tell the youth all the time, quit chasing a world that doesn't even want you. All you're doing is chasing... A social media page you think that's what the world wants in all honesty it's all designed to take you away from God as long as you're away from God it doesn't matter where you end up in it and it will chew you up and it will spit you out the next I will make so when you follow Jesus and you start building relationship with Jesus, you become transformed by Jesus. That's the big word, sanctification. Sanctification is the big old, old, old word. 
I heard it a lot when I was growing up in church. Be sanctified. Sanctified in you. Sanctification. What does that mean? That's dying to yourself every day. I still have things that I fight with. I still have things that I try to give up. Some of the things were easy. Some of the music I listened to gave that up. Some of the things we did outside of church, we give those up. And we think we're walking good. And then Jesus taps you on your shoulder. He goes, hey, hey, that thing. I want that too. Give me that. And we have to be willing to die to ourselves, to give up what's in this world for his eternity. Because it's his eternity, and he's calling us to live in it with him. And that's the end game. This is where Judas missed out. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of Christians miss the mark today. So many of us want to pick up the troubles we laid down at his feet. This is me talking to myself in the mirror. Uh, we want to show that we got it. We want to show Jesus, look, I'm following, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm doing the things that I need to do. When we don't realize that when we say I'm giving it all to you, that's exactly what that means. I'm giving it all to you. I was listening to a preacher once. His name is Matt Chandler. I say his name a lot because I, I, I say it. Um, he once said that, and I didn't understand it at first. I kind of made me want to turn away from him for a little bit, but then I realized that he said, Jesus doesn't care what your priorities are. He wants to be the paper that you write your priorities down on. Everything, all your priority rooted in Jesus your foundational place from where you come from is found in Jesus. Because like Paul says, me, there's nothing good in me. Everything that is good in me comes from him. And being transformed by Jesus, as Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old one passes away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the beauty of having a relationship with Jesus. We don't have to rely on what we knew of as the world. We can throw ourselves onto what's coming, what, what we haven't seen yet, because we know he's already won. It's, it's a given game that we can spend eternity with him if we'll just embrace the fact that we just need to get rid of ourselves and be transformed by him. And while you're following him by being called, while you're transforming, being transformed by Jesus, he says, I will make you a fisher of men. And that's to be on Jesus' mission. And what is that mission? That mission is easy. He, he, he didn't beat around the bush. There was no parable around this one. He gave us the commission. It was called the Great Commission. It's Matthew 28, 18. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. Pretty simple. Go make disciples. It sounds simple enough. I like to talk to people sometimes. I know teenagers nowadays are having a little bit of an issue coming out of their shells. But that's one thing as Christians. It's really weird to me, especially now, that, that I've been on this discipleship shift and, and really pushing the youth towards it and talking to some of the deacons about it. It's really weird to me when a Christian says, I really like going to church, but I don't like people. You can't have one without the other. 
Because the church isn't the four walls of this building. The church is collectively each and every one of us as believers. Called the priesthood of the saints. And so, is it as simple as, as just talking to people? Absolutely. I mean, it's good to make plans and goals. It's good to say, well, I feel like I'm going to be going this. But if you're not willing to pivot on where the Holy Spirit is guiding you, you'll get eventually get back. You'll eventually come back. But how long will it take and how much damage will you take in the meantime? I know it's hard to walk the path. Trust me. I left church. I mean, when I say I left church, I was in Helmer Street Christian Ch or Baptist Church. It was an independent fundamentalist Baptist. I think those should be bad words. In that church, you know, the three unforgivable sins, drinking, swearing, and until the passion of the Christ, watching an R-rated movie. And we judged everyone accordingly on those three things. And then that was Sunday, and then Monday morning I'd get up and I'd go to Helmer Street Baptist School because the church had a private school. So I was at church all the time. And so I get out of, I get out of that. In about seventh grade, we move out of state. I enter my journey into non-private school, public school, and I didn't come back until my 40th birthday. That was a long road to hoe of trying to do things on my own. If I would have just let him have it, laid it all down, I can only imagine where I would be. I mean, where my road got me today is I don't hear her, so she must be asleep, but my granddaughter's in the, in the audience. All my kids are here. I've been able to baptize my kids in that baptistry. I've been able to baptize my brother-in-law in that baptistry. I, I stood next to my brother-in-law when he baptized my niece. I, I don't know what other gifts he can give me to let me know that he's standing right next to me as I walk through this world. And so it sounds simple enough that we go out and we make disciples. What does that mean? What, what do we do? What, what is making disciples? It's, it's building relationships intentionally with each other, with those of, that are around you. Let me ask, what's easier? The guy you've been working on, you're trying to profess the gospel to him, and he's not hearing it, and you're just beating him about the head with the gospel, and you need the gospel, and what's easier to say, hey, you want to come to a Bible study, or hey, let me buy you a cup of coffee, and let that conversation build a relationship where now he's opened up to the gospel. Because where does he see the gospel the most? If we're right, he should see it in us, in you. And Paul says, if you don't know how to do it, just imitate me. Imitate me as I imitate Jesus. And that's all we are expected to do, is to be a direct representation or an imitation of what Jesus did for us. And it all is just an intentional conversation built on relationships. So called, transformed, and on Jesus' mission, the mission of the church, and by that I mean the body of believers following the Great Commission, how do we live this out? How, how do we live out making disciples? First, we follow. To be a disciple, to make disciples, you have to be a disciple. Uh, the Met has a really good uh, 
really good moniker, and I want to steal it. Is that okay? We can steal it? It says, be one, make one. I love that. I love that, that sentiment. It's real short, sweet, to the point, and, and it means exactly what it says. Be a disciple, make a disciple. Follow the Great Commission. Be the church in Acts that didn't, oh, we don't have a building to go to. What are we going to do? Our sound isn't working. What are we going to say? None of us know how to read. What are we going to do? No, that's how the church was built. It was built in each other's homes. It was built in small groups, small groups that would cluster together on a foundation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from that, it exploded to what it is today. So to follow, to make disciples, first you must have to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, transformed or being transformed by Jesus on his mission, which is to make disciples. And how do we, how do, we do that? The second part, we engage. When the welcome music comes in, are you looking to finish the conversation that you had out in the hallway? Or are you looking for the new people to welcome them to this congregation? Honestly, that's a question that I actually have. I never get out of the drum set. And thank you, Miss Faye, for always coming up and, and giving me a hug. I can't get a cup of coffee unless I hug her. <laughs> I was not warned of the hug tariff that in plagues the coffee. <laughs> I, 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 I feel the contract was not negotiated properly. But when we engage people, it's just simply building relationships with intentionality. So we go back to the, the, the scripture. Did Jesus show up on the shore to preach or was he there for the, the apostles? And because he was there for the apostles, the other people showed up, he was going to take that opportunity to preach the gospel. But his intention was to call them. When he met the woman at the well, he had several different routes he could have taken to get from where he was going to Jerusalem. He said, I have to go to that well. Intentionality. When he called Matthew, follow me. We have to be intentional in the relationship, Bill. We can't just, how you doing, Bill? Are you okay? To, now, when we build relationships with each other and we're, and we're living this life together, that doesn't mean we've got to move in together. Could you imagine me, Mike, and Billy living in the same house? <laughs> it's like the odd couple gone way wrong. Billy's OCD, I'm a slob, and Mike is just out there, all right? So... But no, it's just we have to start living, living, living with each other in our daily lives. We have to be fully known to each other. We have to ensure that we have accountability partners to keep us straight. We have to have people that we can be vulnerable with. And we can get rid of what's on our chest. That way we're not having to carry that burden alone. Paul preaches, carry, carry one another's burdens. I am thankful daily for the ability to reach out to Mike at any time. Hey, I'm having a rough day. I, I take it a privilege that Mike can do the same. Hey, I'm having a rough day. Can you just pray for me? And if he wants to tell me what's going on, he can tell me. All I know is I've been called to pray for him. He's my brother, and I need to pray. And I would hope that you have partners and you have people in your lives that you could do that with too because it keeps you out of trouble because he's my meme checker. 
Can I post this on Facebook? No, nah, I probably wouldn't do that, bro. That's not going to be a good thing. And they're funny, but they're not appropriate. You need that accountability. It keeps you out of trouble. And you have to be open to it. You have to be vulnerable to it. I mean, the Ten Commandments are completely built on relationship. You have, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. That's our relationship with him. Remember the Sabbath. That's to maintain our relationship with him. Don't give false witness about your neighbor. That breaks relationship with each other. The first half is relational with God. The latter half of the Ten Commandments are relational with each other and God. And so we want to change the church. We want to become relevant in the community and a, a beacon of hope to them. We want to change the world. First, we've got to change ourselves. To be disciple makers, we must get back to being disciples ourselves. Building intentional relationships with each other. Not just thinking Sunday. Sunday should be second on our mind. We've had this conversation and it was very uncomfortable. Everything that we do as a praise team is gearing up for the 30 minutes we play up here. Folks, we should have a Sunday second mentality. As the church, we should be gearing you for every day. We should be gearing you for the relationship building to carry your ministries to where you work, to where you live, to your neighborhoods. And Sunday morning should be a celebration and a time of encouragement for all those things that are going on in your lives, in your own small groups, your own home churches, your own ability to have people in your lives that we do not. Kids that are still in school have the perfect opportunity to be disciple makers, especially those that go to public school. There's no more see you at the poll events like what we had when we were growing up. There's no more pastors walking the hallway praying at the lockers like we had when I was growing up. There's no people there that the kids can run to except for a counselor. So therefore, you have to be, as teenagers, you have to be the disciples. You have to be, while they're walking through the hallways and slamming into lockers in the dark because they can't see, and oh, there's a bright light. Well, who's that bright light? Lorna, Jeremiah, Noah, Savannah. That's y'all's job in high school, by the way. They hate it when I call them out by name. I'm just letting y'all know that. And it's not just Southern hospitality either. Southern hospitality is a little bit of nuanced, and depending on what region of the South you're in, I'm from the great United States of Texas. We've always done it the same way. We are barbecue eaters. I, uh, I broke the sound, we broke the barriers. We didn't have a traditional Thanksgiving. We actually had Cajun Thanksgiving this year, which was hard on a lot of people. Um, I think I still have leftovers, so if anybody needs food, I have some. I'll give you my address. <laughs> we should enter Chris in some food challenges. I bet you he'd win. (laughs) But we got to intentionally engage each other, engage the people in our lives. We have to engage them first in the truth, in the truth of the gospel. What Jesus did for you, what Jesus did for me, why there is a God that loves his creation so much that he would step off the throne of judgment onto the throne of grace and step down and become God in the flesh for us so that we could spend the rest of eternity with him. If that's not intentionality, I don't know what is. And to pay the price for that, he sent his son to the cross to take on our sin. He took that burden for the entirety of the world, past, present, and future. 
so that we might come to him. And when we give them the truth in love, we start building an accountability with each other, being open and honest and vulnerable and able to take each other at our word. We start showing attributes of all the attributes of the Holy Spirit. We, we show love. Right now, we got to answer the question, love for whom? Someone that's showing the measures of the Holy Spirit is always peaceful. We're trying to make peace between who at this point? Kindness. Joy. Joy, that's one thing. Don't confuse happiness with joy. I've, this is a modern church thing of God just wants you happy. God doesn't care if you're happy. God wants you to have joy through the salvation of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Happiness is a fleeting emotion. I ate a whole bunch of food. I was very happy. The food didn't set well. Emotion gone. But the time I got to set out at the barbecue pit with my brother-in-law and we could just talk and just be together, that's joy. That's something no one can take away from me. And we need to have that with each other. Give a little grace, a little forgiveness, a little understanding. Be kind. If someone pours their heart out to you, Recognize their hurt. Recognize their feelings. The worst thing you can do to someone that's pouring your heart, their heart out to you is say, cool, I'll pray for you. Walk with them. As Jesus walks with you, walk with them. And we have to love one another. We absolutely have to love one another. Jesus says that's how we'll be identified. We'll be identified by the way we love. Love each other as I loved you. And by that, they will know you're my disciples. And how do we love each other? We lay down our lives for each other. I mean, take a bullet. Some of you, most of you, absolutely. I would take a bullet for you in a heartbeat. But I will also put myself aside so that Jesus might show through me. And that's where we need to be. They need to see, there's a Casting Crown song, Only Jesus. Mike, we need to play Only Jesus at some point. So, Fishers of men, called by Jesus, transformed by Jesus, on Jesus' mission, going out and making disciples through intentional relationships. Don't just leave this at the door on Sunday when you leave here. Sunday should be second. Sunday, this should be your encouragement time. This is, Billy says it all the time, this should be your refueling station. This should be the place where you come and you get renewed with the power of the Holy Spirit. You get renewed with that sense. You shine your armor up. So you can go out into that world and you can, you can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's God moved toward his creation in an act of love. He took on flesh. He took on the burden of our sin. He went to the cross of Calvary. And he sacrificed himself so we could live in eternity with him. So we could have joy everlasting. So we could have relationship with him. Why would we not want to go out and do the same with everyone we come in contact with? Now, I know some of us are at the end of our ropes. Maybe today is the day. Let go. Just let go. What are you holding on to? 
pain, the hurt of something that happened, let it go. Give it to Him. If you don't believe, if this is the first time you've experienced the gospel, if you don't know if Jesus is your Lord and Savior and that at the end of the age, you will be with Him forever, today's the day. Don't let that day pass. Today's the day of salvation. If you need help, you need prayer, you need to let something go, Billy will be on the wings. We have deacons in the back. If you're not comfortable coming up to the front, there's people all around here that would just love to hug on you and pray and just take you and show you a love that only Jesus can show, and that's through us, his people. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you sent your son down to the cross of Calvary to take our sins. We thank you for the relationship that you build with us if we only allow it, if we just let go. And as we leave here today, we, I hope we are encouraged. There's someone that has been placed in the back of each and every one of our minds that we need to reach out to, and we need to make sure that they're okay. And if they don't know, the truth of the gospel, that let us be the tool and the implement to give them that truth. And as we move forward today, I just thank you for all that you've done for me. I thank you for my family. I thank you for this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.